Welcome to the WWE Podcast. Your place for the most passionate wrestling analysis on the web. Just turn Roman heel. What is WWE waiting for? When other wrestling podcasts put you to sleep, you can count on the WWE Podcast to keep you engaged and asking for more. I've been watching wrestling for over 20 years, and that was one of the best matches I've ever seen. This is unlike any other wrestling analysis. So without any further delay, let's get the show started right now. Welcome to the one and only WWE Podcast on Tuesday, October 22nd, 2019. And it's not only October 22nd. It's also WWE 2K20 release day. Now, normally I would say, hey, great day for WWE. It's their annual 2K release. And I've been, I've owned, I think, every single video game WWE has ever produced. You know, back from before the No Mercy days. I'm talking about like when it was on Sega Genesis. And so like, that's how long I've been going through the iterations of, of uh of WWE going through their probably best game of all time I think most of us would agree No Mercy and WrestleMania 2000 and into um Raw and then eventually the SmackDown series Just Bring It Shut Your Mouth um Know Your Ro- or uh, not SmackDown Know Your Role was SmackDown 2 and then it went into the SmackDown versus Raw series and then that ended at WWE 12. So after SmackDown versus Raw 2011, it became WWE 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. And so the reason I'm bringing, bringing that up, and many of you may not even care about WWE video games, but the reason I'm bringing this up is I was uh, I was on Twitter earlier today, and um, I, I just check out what's, what's trending. And the first thing I see this morning, fix WWE... 2K20. That was the hashtag. And I'm like, oh boy. And it kept climbing and climbing and climbing until at least I saw, um, I think it got to like number eight overall on Twitter. Now it could have fluctuated a little bit higher, but that is the highest that I saw it reach was number eight on, you know, in the entire app. Not good. Uh, not good at all. It was apparently laden with bugs. I'm really glad that I didn't pre-order. I thought I was going to, um, and then last second I said, oh, I'm gonna maybe hold off this year and wait till Black Friday when they, you know, have like a 50% off sale. And I'm really glad I didn't bother. Um, this apparently has been a complete disaster of a launch day for 2K20. A complete disaster. People are ripping it to shreds. Um, graphics, I guess, are worse. Uh, the the bugs are number one issue. Uh, just some of the bugs, though, I will say this, and then I'll get off this video game topic and get right to the WWE Monday Night Raw review, is some of the bugs, man, are absolutely effing hilarious. I, I mean, just hilarious. Like, I I don't know what it is. It's like a guilty pleasure of um, of wrestling bugs, wrestling game bugs in, in specifically. It's just something that's so funny that can happen. Like, for example, one of the bugs I saw, uh, the... The person on the way to the ring, I guess it was a creative wrestler, ended up tripping on the way to the ring. And you could tell that it was not supposed to happen because they just morphed into the middle, like the side of the ring. They went up the steps and then just morphed into the steps. Um, Ronda Rousey getting caught in the ropes, like on a loop. And then (laughs) their opponent was doing this like backwards, weird uh, knee walk. It was just hilarious. And and, and just some of the things that I tweeted out one of the other bugs too that I saw. It's just so funny. If you want to laugh, I'm sure you could YouTube it. Just WWE 2K20 uh, bugs and you'll get a kick out of it. I, I don't know why that I find that stuff so funny. Um, but not funny for the people who shelled out 90 bucks for the deluxe version only to get the big shaft uh, and end up with a game that's not finished. Now, to the defense of 2K Sports, Ukes ended up dropping out um, early this year, and they helped in the development of the game. And so 2K was basically left up to do it a lot of it themselves. And so I get it, but well, I don't know why they couldn't have just waited until they said, hey, let's wait until this video game is actually functional for us to release it to the, to the public. And... I don't know where the quality control came in here. If there was 
such a thing before, oh, I don't know, it was released to the public. Maybe they're thinking, well, people are going to complain, but we'll come out with patches. Well, the, you know, the thing with that is, yeah, it may fix some of the issues, but it leaves people with a bad taste in their mouths if that was their strategy. And they're saying, well, WWE has a you know really tight schedule. They, you know, we're under contract with them. We have to deliver this game. And people are going to be pissed. You know, we anticipate that, but, you know, we're going to do our best to put the fixes out there as patches. Um, well, yes, again, as I said, you can do that, but you're also chipping away the goodwill of fans. The ones that are just annually purchasing this this uh, franchise blindly, knowing that at least it's a halfway decent and sometimes really good game. I enjoyed 2K19. I think it was the best version that they've put out in years. And to go from 19 to 20 and have it just fall off a cliff is completely unacceptable. You, you just can't do that if you're if you're uh, not really WWE. They aren't the ones who were developing it, but 2K, who have, should have said, hey, listen, we're, we have to delay this. We can't release this pile of crap to the public. We just can't. Um, but nonetheless, I, I will, I'll get off the video game bandwagon. But anyway, if you want to laugh, just uh, YouTube it or go on Twitter. And it's still trending, I believe. Just uh, search out those glitches. Some of them, like I said, it's just <laughs> hilarious and just preposterous stuff. Uh, anyway, guys, thank you so much for joining me. And we're going to get to Monday Night Raw, which uh, was overall, I think, a just kind of a it was it was a better show. Certainly a better show for the first Monday Night Raw after the draft. So this is the new world of Raw. And we got some re-debuts of Drew McIntyre and Kevin Owens. Really nice to see them back. And back in programs that don't involve Shane McMahon. That is probably the best part of this whole thing. Is that Kevin Owens and and Drew McIntyre are starting to wash the stink of the Vince McMahon storylines off of them. And then get involved in things that actually matter. Now... You could say Drew McIntyre, oh, he's involved in the stupid Flair Hogan thing. And yeah, this match actually means little to nothing of who wins. Nothing other than apparently all five members of Team Flair and all five members of Team Hogan are fighting for the egos of their prospective captains. And I just, I, I guess that that's just the, that's the hook. Whatever, I'll roll with it. It's professional wrestling and Flair and Hogan are some of the biggest names, two of the biggest names in professional wrestling history. They're certainly on the route Rushmore of wrestling. So fine, I'll roll with that. And, um, you know, and Flair was in rare form Monday night. Flair was in uh, Ric Flair mode. And yeah, he stumbled on some stuff. Some stuff didn't really make a whole lot of sense. He may have gone too far with some of the things he said. Um, and I, I may have been a little bit much, but I enjoyed Flair being Flair at 70 some years old, being the best iteration that he can of being the nature boy. Like, I'm fine with that. Um, as I said, went off the rails. Who cares? I'm fine with it. Ric Flair is an, a living legend. I mean, he really is. And, uh, who you know, you don't know how much longer you have with Rick with his multiple health scares and things. I don't take seeing legends for granted anymore. I, I really, I just don't. I mean, look what happened with Warrior, right? Warrior comes out, comes up to Monday Night Raw the night after WrestleMania, cuts that speech, that infamous speech, Next day, drops dead on the sidewalk. I mean, so you, you you just never know when you're going to see the legend or legends for the last time. So people may complain. Oh, they're old. Oh, they can't do matches anymore. Oh, my God, Undertaker is terrible. Why do they keep running him out there? He should have retired years ago. All this kind of thing. You will lament for these days. You really will. And not that this is the most interesting things thing that they've ever done, but... There will never again be a Flair. There will never again be a Hogan. Regardless of all of his racial issues and racist comments he made in the past, I understand all that, and I think that those that, you know that was a big black stain on the career and personal life of Hulk Hogan. No question about it. But the fact of the matter is that guy and Flair were revolutionary in what they did to professional wrestling, the contributions they made, the stables they created, the four horsemen, NWO. I mean, think about that, what they did, right? How long they were in wrestling. And so my, my point is, I just, as much as we all love to complain about the legends and their, they overstay their welcome and WWE really relies on them too much, I think people need to take, take a step back and realize, yeah, they're not who they were. 
I understand that. I am going to enjoy them for what they are now because I appreciate what they did for us and the, this company and this business and this brand of entertainment that we all love, right? You can't, and it's not fair to compare them to what they were 20 or 25 years ago. It, you just can't. It's not fair. Were you the same you were 25 years ago? I'm not. 25 years ago, I was nine years old. Okay? So am I the same as I was at nine years old? No. Do I have some attributes that linger from nine years old? You bet your ass. <laughs> but but my point, though, is I think we just need to take a step back and, and really just appreciate every appearance we get from any of these legends. Um, even Goldberg. Would I want to see a Goldberg-Undertaker match, if that's what you're wondering? Hell no. I didn't want to see that to begin with. But... Just uh, realize what you're seeing and and, um, know that time is of the essence anytime you see these appearances. So anyway, um, so we, we, you know, we got a return of uh, of Drew McIntyre and I loved it. I I thought that was awesome. So we're going to talk about that. And of course, Kevin Owens at the end of the show returning to join the Street Profits. And uh, do I know why? No, I have no idea why. But you know what? I don't care. Kevin Owens is not involved with Shane McMahon and that's all I care about about at this point so uh, again um, but thank you for joining me this is the WWE podcast thank you again and uh, hit me up on Twitter if you'd like at the WWE podcast or on email at real WWE podcast at gmail.com if you have questions or things that you'd like me to discuss during this show always tweet me at the WWE podcast so uh, I can get your question answered on the air or even email me I do actually check my email, I promise. So, uh, tomorrow I'll be back with Wrestling Nostalgia. And then on Saturday, Anthony DeMarco and I rejoin and reconnect for our WWE Week in Review, where, of course, we'll talk about Raw, we'll talk about the news coming out of during the week, and then we will review, of course, Friday Night SmackDown. So, a big show coming on Saturday, and a double dose of this show, of two different co-hosts of Zach and Chris who cover AEW and NXT dropping Thursday, sometimes early into early Friday morning, depending on what I get my files together and uh, get some editing and all that kind of good stuff. But uh, it's usually Thursday into early Friday morning. I get you the double dose of NXT and AEW reviews. So um, definitely and check that out and, uh, and um, support the show. And speaking of supporting the show though, if you'd like to, in a extremely free, cost you nothing way, hit me up on uh, a review. If you like the show and you want to give me a five-star review, by all means, please do. It really helps out the ratings on the Apple Podcasts or really anywhere podcasts are available. And now, available for the first time on Radio.com. This show is now available on Radio.com, so really excited to be joining that uh, part of the family and being able to... Uh, distribute this show on as many platforms as humanly possible. So Radio.com is a big deal. Radio.com is, is a huge deal, and uh, it's it's a growing brand for podcasts. It's not just live radio anymore. It is Podcast Nation. So uh, check me out there. And if you'd like to get an ad-free experience, you guys know what I'm going to say. You head over to Patreon.com slash WWE Podcast. And uh, exclusive blogs there, exclusive thoughts, um, some video And, of course, all ad-free. Shout out on the show. You can even come on the show and have your own co-hosted show. Yeah, pretty cool deal. So um, I would encourage you to do that. Well, let's get to Monday Night Raw. And uh, let's talk about right from the beginning here. Ric Flair comes out. And he's talked trash to the fan in front row. He he basically goes heel. And he said he's going to beat the hell out of Team Hogan. And then introduces the next team member, or next member of Team Flair, Drew McIntyre. So Drew comes out and says that he's granting a favor to Rick, and he tells Rick to take a front row seat so he can give him a preview of what he's going to do at Crown Jewel. So it ends up being uh, Drew McIntyre and Ricochet. Good match here. Really enjoyed this match. I think it was competitive. We got to see Ricochet um, really be able to work and sell for Drew McIntyre. Uh, this guy is a no question a star in the making. Um, so it, it, it was just a really good matchup. I, I could see these two in a longer feud, maybe a couple of months. 
Um, I don't think right now because of this team versus team format that they're in. But down the line, I would be fine if these two ended up clashing for a longer feud, if you will. Um, so ends with Drew McIntyre winning as it should have. I got really worried, really worried after Ricochet hit that moonsault that it was going to be him getting the victory. And here we go with, uh, you know, Ricochet getting the the the, um, the win when he doesn't need it. And no, Drew McIntyre with the Claymore gets a decisive win for the three count. There's really no other way to go about this here. You could not have Drew return only to lose to Ricochet. You, you just can't by the laws of wrestling. You can't. So they did the only thing they could do, and they did the right thing. Um, so, uh, then they went to replays and we saw Flair celebrating at ringside after the match, Drew ended up picking up Ricochet, headbutting him, which looked brutal, very good looking headbutt and then threw him into the ring post and then, uh, hit a DDT and then threw him via an Alabama slam onto the ring steps. Great stuff. Great stuff. Um, we then had Alistair Black and Jason Reynolds, Alistair Black wins. He hits Alistair Black hit Black Mass. I think this match was quicker than my description of it. I don't care. That's fine. And that's not to say that I don't want to see Alistair Black. I do. But what they're doing, and I said this last week, is that they are simply making a foundation for Alistair Black. They are setting the table for Alistair Black. People who want to see him immediately, oh, he should be in a title picture. He should be in the Intercontinental Championship picture. He should be in the Universal. Let's slow down. Slow down. Alistair Black will get there. Right now, yeah, he may be kind of floating around the uh, the independent scene or floating around beating up these no-name guys that you've never heard of, and that's fine. What did Braun Strowman do for months and months and months? And the formula worked pretty damn well. And I think Alistair Black is a big-time player down the line. I just, I'm fine with the slow burn here. I'm fine with his backstage promos. I love them. And I think that having him take the slow road, take the the road less traveled, meaning that they don't just rush him to the top and realize what they have, let him build, make the fans feel that when he faces somebody that's relevant, it's a big deal. Well, how's he going to, oh, well, he's been beating up people real easy that we've never heard of. How does he fare against so-and-so? It's a slow burn. My favorite. So, all right. Then we get a, uh, a oh my God, this whole thing. I, you know, with my last show with uh, Mary Grader, we recorded our show on, on uh, what the heck was it, Saturday? I think it was. I didn't release it till Sunday. I got just so heated I had to leave my computer. Um, but those of you that are not into the ranting type of show, and this, I really, really don't do it unless I feel it. I got very mixed feedback on that show. Some people absolutely loved it. Some people thought it was one of the best shows we've ever done. And then other people who said, oh my God, what the hell was that? Blah, 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 right? And I had a feeling that that, that type of show would then in kind elicit that type of response. A very bipolar response. <clears throat> and that's fine. I expected that fully. But I'm just giving you guys a heads up. If you haven't listened to my last show, be forewarned. It is labeled, labeled explicit, the only one in the entire history of the, this show. And it is very rant heavy. Not just for the sake of being rant heavy, but because WWE deserved every licking and lash that they had coming. Every single one. And I still, still I stand by every single word. I don't take anything back. I am standing by my guns of every single thing that I said. So, but I'm going to try to, um, I'm going to try to tone it down a bit for this, but moving on to Lashley and Lana, which were woven into a couple segments of this show. And Jerry Lawler had Rusev on King's court. And, um, you know, Lawler talks about seeing a little too much of Bobby Lashley and Lana lately and that everyone's been talking about it except for Rusev. So he brings Rusev out and he says that Lashley has poisoned Lana's brain and for that he will be crushed. And Rusev says he's still hoping and praying that he and Lana will get through this. 
Lashley and Lana appear on the screen. So let me stop there. And I'm, re- I'm reading the the review of the or reading the, uh, the 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 play by play here. This is making Rusev look like a complete fool, a complete and utter fool. You're telling me that Rusev is completely blaming this on Lashley as if Lashley is some kind of witch doctor that he has some kind of telekinesis mind control he, he he's basically got some kind of superpower in which he can just hypnotize Lana into not having the ability to make her own effing decisions why is he blaming Lashley why he can't have a match with Lana I guess that's the reason But Lana is a big girl. And Rusev, for weeks and weeks, has watched them do their massage and lay in a hotel bed and now out to dinner and make out in front of them on the stage. What? And Rusev is just, well, you know, Lashley will pay and, and Lana will come to her senses. Let me tell you something. Let me ask you, better yet, Let me ask you guys, if your significant other did exactly what is happening to Rusev to you, oh, and on national television for three weeks straight, is it four now? I don't even know anymore. Would you just say, well, you know, it's not the person that I'm in a relationship with I'm mad at. It's the other one that took them from me. Really? And, you know, but in, in what the scary thing is that I see this sometimes in the real world, especially with guys who get mad at other guys for taking their women. Well, now, wait a minute. Why are you mad at that other person? You should be mad at your significant other who is choosing like a big boy or girl to decide if they want to be with you. Nobody's putting a gun to their head. And if you're going to allow somebody to do that and just say, "Eh, well, they come to the senses, you need to look at yourself in the mirror for a self-esteem problem. And Rusev is looking like a complete fool for this happening and allowing it to happen on national television. Again, I know this is all storyline. It's all fantasy. I get it. I get it. And I'm probably digging a little too deep into real life, but art imitates life here. Am I, am I thinking overthinking this? I don't think I am. I understand that this is wrestling and they need to get to a match because this has to end in a match because this is pro wrestling. And the only, only logical conclusion is Bobby Lashley versus Rusev, of which no one will give a sh- damn. <laughs> no one's going to care. Because they're making Rusev a complete idiot. They're making him look foolish for sticking with Lana. Foolish. <sighs> All right. Well, I think I've said my my piece. Yes, Rusev crashed the dinner and uh, he attacked Lashley. Ugh. All right. Let's move on before I go on another rant. Okay. Sin Cara versus Andrade. I think this was one of the better matches of Raw. I enjoyed the hell out of this. Um, and let me say this too. Zelina adds so much to Andrade's character. They are peanut butter and jelly. They are just... And I know that in real life, Andrade is... Uh, is dating Charlotte. We all know that. But in a business form, and they label her as such as a business associate because that's actually exactly what she is. These two go together so well. I love it. Um, And it was also a nice way to reintroduce Sin Cara to the audience. You know, a, a guy that has been all but forgotten in the history of WWE. All but forgotten. And now he's had a very nice pairing with Andrade who works very well with these Mexican luchadors of Rey Mysterio. Now who they had how many awesome matches and now Sin Cara, similar style. Very good. I expect this to continue. Andrade ends up winning with his hammerlock DDT after, uh, Zelina hits a cheap shot on Sin Cara. Um, I think it was it was a great match. I really really enjoyed this, and I would love to see these two in a fifteen twenty minute ma- match if given enough time. There's a lot here, well, a lot that they could do. Two professionals in the ring, 
doing what they do. So I'm looking forward, hopefully, to another uh, another encounter with these two. Then Umberto Carrillo is backstage for an interview. Remember that guy that got drafted last week? Yeah, him. Um, where he says that when you face Andrade, you have to face Selena at the same time. And Umberto says Andrade could be a future Universal Champion. Um, Umberto also says he has a lot to prove. But he will be champion too one day, and he won't be a champion who plays like who plays with fire like Seth Rollins. Um, okay, we'll get more to that later. The Street Profits are shown backstage, and they're talking about their match and making fun of AJ's hair and their hand symbols. Can we get off the soccer mom stuff? That thing died about a year and a half ago. It was kind of funny when you heard it the first time, but by the 319th time... I don't even bat an eye. I actually groan. I groan. It's an overuse. We all know what a soccer mom stereotype looks like. We all know the lush, the feminine type hair that AJ has. I don't care. I don't care. Enough, enough of the soccer mom stuff. But um, the Street Profits in their just obscenity of nonsensical rhymes and um, over the top flamboyant to the point of way too sports entertainment to all sizzle, no steak, do all of their weird gyrations and their standing parallel and talking to the camera rather than themselves. Um, their usual stint that I absolutely loathe. I loathe it. I loathe it. And uh, I, I just, I cannot stand their act. I don't know how they are face, baby face. I, I just don't know what market this appeals to. I just don't. Um, I think they're talented in the ring, and they are. They proved it in the uh, their tag match with the OC. They absolutely did. So I have nothing to take away from them inside the ring. Nothing, other than maybe they look like yeah, they, they look honestly like their attire. I'll be honest with you, they look like Harlem Globetrotters. That's exactly what they look like. I mean, maybe get away from the Harlem Globetrotter type deal. But anyway. Inside the ring, can't take a thing away from them. Skilled as hell. They're outside obnoxious personalities. It's a channel-changing, groan-worthy personality. Uh, th- th- their, their whole gimmick is just, I, I don't know, not my cup of tea. I'll leave it at that without uh, cussing. Okay, um, we got more from the Viking Raiders who face Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins. As you'd expect, the Viking Raiders win. Um Eric knees Ryder in the face and Ivar tags in and then they hit the Viking experience on Hawkins for the three count. Oh, I mean, what else do you expect? It's just a, you know, after they win the tag team belts, I guess it's a way to just, Hey, by the way, this tag team's still here. Just, uh, I don't know. This just didn't do anything for the Viking Raiders who became tag champs and then face Hawkins and Ryder. Uh, fine, I guess. I'm fine with it. At least they put them on the show, so I'll give them credit for that. All right. Um, I talked about Lashley and Lana. We're not going to go back there. And then Rey Mysterio is shown arriving at the arena with his, his arm still in a sling. Love that, by the way. That needs to be done more often, where a guy or gal who went through hell or a, a, a hellacious beating by their enemy needs to come out once in a while with a neck brace, a crutch, uh, a knee brace, a sling. It's so effective because it reminds you of the damage that can be inflicted. In this case, Brock Lesnar. How long ago did Brock Lesnar attack Dominic and Rey Mysterio? And you, you wonder, you go, why is he in a sling? Oh, that's right. He's in that sling because of Brock. It just, it's like the gift that keeps giving when you do that because it reminds fans of why you are in the situation you're in and why you have that injury. It it just it's one of those things that I think is overlooked so many times in WWE. But I love it. I, lo- I love the fact that Rey Mysterio is coming out wearing the sling. So um, he Ray gets on the mic and thanks the WWE universe. God, I hate that phrase um, for their support. I'm going to say the WWE fans and talks about how they're like his family now. Oh, God, gag me. Does anybody does WWE even understand what makes a baby face today in 2019? I mean, really? Why is it so... Why does that have to be so cuddly? Was Stone Cold like that? 
Was The Rock like that? Was CM Punk like that? No, they weren't. They weren't transparently vomit-inducing, let's have a feel-good kumbaya moment. It's, ugh. I, I was honestly never, like, I am a Rey Mysterio fan from the perspective of respecting him in the ring. He had a, obviously, extreme overachiever in his career. Legendary luchador. All that's true. Always despised his character. Always. Just a constant pandering. Constant. So, I loved when Brock Lesnar came out and beat the holy hell out of him, by the way, just for the record. It was, I loved it. And the fact that he destroyed Dominic, huh, just icing on the cake. Okay, <laughs> moving on from my sadistic mind. Um, so, he talks about how, Rey Mysterio talks about how Kane is going to take out Lesnar at Crown Jewel. Paul Heyman interrupts on the big screen and Heyman talks some trash. Shelton Benjamin then comes out and gets in the ring and talks about how um, he says, basically, he I mean, he he trained Brock Lesnar and lived with Brock Lesnar um, and starts to bully around Shelton. And Kane Velasquez comes out to make the save and he starts shoving him around. And Kane Velasquez, I mean, Honestly, I don't think he got the reaction. WWE probably thought that they hoped he would. It was very muted. I mean, there were some cheers, but it wasn't exactly, you know, game seven of the World Series, bottom of the ninth home run, walk off home run. Um, it, of course, had Kane Velasquez standing strong after putting him in a choke and giving a couple of weird kind of, I guess, wrestling maneuvers. But the punches that he threw, look. I'm willing to give this a chance. I don't want to crap on this Cain Velasquez signing. I'm fine with Cain Velasquez coming in. Again, I think he's got great facials. Great facials. His body can be worked on, and that's the biggest thing for me. But he's got great facials. He's got a a naturally nasty look, and I love that. So he's got the genetics and uh, was born looking like that, and that's a positive if you want to be... Uh, marketable in WWE. But again, my, my hang up is Cain Velasquez getting a WWE championship opportunity at crown jewel. And I love how Shelton Benjamin pointed that out by the way, and says that um, all he has to do is shove him in. Hey, I get a championship match. Is somebody listening to this show. <laughs> I mean, really? Oh okay. uh, yeah. So again, it was made to look, have Cain Velasquez look good and Shelton was the scapegoat for that. Fine. Fine. I'm going to let's, I'm going to see where this goes before I destroy anything. So keep it going. WWE. Let's see what you got. Uh, universal champion. Seth Rollins was backstage and he talks about everyone saying Bray Wyatt is in his head, but now Seth is in Wyatt's head. Um, he then sees Umberto and walks over to him and Seth tells him that when you're champion, you have to make tough decisions. And he says he burned down the Firefly Funhouse once. He'd do it again. And he can't do all these things that are popular. He has to do what's right. Um, he says that Seth says he can appreciate that Umberto wants to be a champion one day. So why doesn't he face Seth in the ring tonight? Right now. So that's what happens in the uh, main event. Seth Rollins versus Umberto. And a non-title match. Thank God. And uh, this match, look, it, it was exactly what it probably should have been. Putting new talent on the map, giving the elder statesman a scare, having a couple of hope spots, and then eventually Seth Rollins puts him away. And then they shake hands in respect and say, attaboy, you know, good job, kid, that kind of thing. And so fine, it's about building new stars. I I really can't complain about it. I know that it's Seth Rollins versus who? Huh? But we all talk about new stars or we always say, oh, it's the same people. Well, WWE has to start somewhere. They can't just keep going to the well on the same people and overexposing people. Plus, you have the draft now implemented. This is where you utilize that extra time where you always had, oh, the same four people are on SmackDown that are on Raw, and there's no real brand split anymore, and, oh, the wild card rules, so, eh, well, there goes all the chances and the opportunities for new talent to get on the air because it's going to be the same people all the time. Well, this is a result and a benefit, I think, 
of the draft. You now have a guy that would never have even been thought of to put in the main event. In the main event. It's called brand awareness. Humberto Carrillo, hey, bring him on. In the main event, fine. Non-title, absolutely. Let's see what he's got. And I think he put up a good uh, a good showing. And it, was it outstanding? Was it memorable? Well, you know, I'll be thinking about this for months and I won't be able to sleep tonight. No, I won't. I'll sleep just fine. Trust me on that. So I really, I don't have anything bad to say about this in the semi-main event. So Seth Rollins wins and we move on. So the OC versus the Street Profits and question mark, right? So ends up being, of course, Kevin Owens, who hits a stunner on AJ at ringside, and then um, it allows Ford to hit a dive on Gallows, and then Dawkins slams Anderson down, then Ford hits a frog splash off the top for the three count. So the, the Street Profits win. And I'm fine with it. I think that having the Street Profits get a victory here and instead of just standing backstage like buffoons, and riddling out a bunch of nonsense. I'm much happier seeing them in the ring than on the mic. It makes me want to just slap them and myself and put, you know, like forks in my eyes and ears every time that I see them backstage. It's just, anyway, I'm glad they put them in a match is what I'm trying to say. And in the main event of the show, I am a Street Profit fan from the perspective of their physical abilities period the OC of course they're up and down they're left and right and AJ has been kind of stale honestly over the last few weeks few months even and having Owens come out and stun AJ I think is a sign of things to come for a potential one-on-one program with these two obviously we have crown jewel coming up next Thursday very weird day to have a pay-per-view very weird on Halloween so, again, I don't know how many people will actually be watching via the network live because of all the Halloween festivities going on in the States and uh, trick-or-treating and things. But, nonetheless, the Crown Jewel pay-per-view, full steam ahead uh, next Thursday, October 31st. So, um, look, I, I think overall Monday Night Raw was solid. I think it was solid. I can't bury it other than the Lana Lashley Rusev awfulness, which is still just puzzling. I love Drew McIntyre back. Drew McIntyre coming back. This guy has champion written all over him. All over him. This guy, I don't know how he hasn't had a belt yet. Uh, and if they're, they didn't, they don't know what to do with him. I can tell you what to do with him. Long term He'll run as champion. Pretty damn easy to follow. He needs a championship opportunity. This guy needs a belt. He needs a long run. And I think you are talking about a money heel champion where baby faces challenge and challenge and challenge and he cheats to win or, or is dominating or whatever. There is so much you can do with Drew McIntyre. So much that it hasn't even been touched yet. So I'm very high on Drew. Very good to see Kevin Owens back. No Shane McMahon. Um, fresh cone of paint there. Fresh start. Alistair Black getting a victory. Andrade and Sin Cara putting on a very good match. Um, Umberto getting a chance against Seth Rollins to put him on the map and get him the rub. The um, Street Profits, you know, in the ring are great. Out the, outside the ring, I want to deliver a stunner, you know. But overall, look, I think it was a slightly thumbs up Raw. If you were going to put me on the spot, I would say slightly thumbs up for Monday Night Raw, which, hey, I'll take it. I'll take it. I really don't want to rant on WWE. when, But when they deserve it, they deserve it. I, and I stick by everything that I say. So uh, let me know what you guys thought. Did you enjoy Monday Night Raw? Did you think it was a little bit flat? Were you probably saying, what the hell is um, who, Umberto? You got to remember, WWE needs to build new stars. They got to start somewhere. They have to start somewhere. So those of you that are complaining about, oh, there's all the same people. Oh, well, we want big stars. Well, where do you think big stars get their start? Somewhere. So I applaud WWE for at least giving them, giving the effort and the opportunity to new faces. 
And it's not all about new matchups that's going to solve everything, which Stephanie McMahon and Shane McMahon and Triple H and Vince McMahon all came out last fall and said, oh, well, this, we, were, we heard you and we're going to give you new matchups, as if that is the problem. That is a symptom. That is a symptom. The real problem is their approach to what professional wrestling is. That's the problem. But that's a podcast and a complete rant for another show, which I will not expose you to here. So, um, But guys, before I close this out, I want to invite you again to check out patreon.com slash WWE podcast to get a completely ad free experience of this show. You can also hit me up on Twitter at WWE pot, the WWE podcast. And of course you can uh, head over to the website. You know what that is. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow with some wrestling nostalgia. Not sure what I'm going to do yet. I have a couple of options, but I haven't fully decided on exactly what I'll be doing for wrestling nostalgia. Uh, but I know you guys enjoy it. I love doing it. It's like a, a transport back into time to when I was you know, a teenager or early 20s. And uh, much different life back then. Much different. But it's always a fun ride. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. So check that out. And of course, Double Dose Thursday night into Friday. The NXT and AEW. And then we run into a, uh, a a Saturday show with my co-host, Anthony DeMarco, this week, where we talk about everything in the world of WWE, Friday Night SmackDown, Monday Night Raw, everything in between, including some rumors about CM Punk, who says he's open to a, a returning to wrestling, all that kind of thing, of which he plays continuous mind games for, and is a brilliant, evil genius at it. So, uh, again, thank you guys for joining me. As always, I'll talk to you next time.